Good afternoon. I'm Eric Lenask from TMC. Uh, and first of all, welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to be kicking off today's event, Measure, Improve, and Manage Your Data Center Energy Efficiency. And uh, frankly, I'm even more pleased that uh, you all have been able to join us for today's event, which really uh, touches on and, and, in fact, gets really to the heart of um, an increasingly important topic in a world that's uh, becoming more and more dominated by mobile and cloud technologies. Uh, now, I'm sure many of you, if, if not all of you, have read the recent New York Times series on data center uh, efficiency. Uh, honestly, it's an interesting read at the very least, but it's also one that, um, while you may take some issue with uh, some of what's been said, it does bring, bring up some very legitimate points, specifically regarding um, the lack of uh, energy efficiency in a lot of the data centers around the world today. Uh, in fact, uh, on a separate note, a study commissioned recently by uh, IBM earlier this year found that only one in five data centers are actually energy efficient. Uh, that's, uh, if you look at it from the other side, an awful lot of inefficiency and waste. Now, going back to the, uh, the New York Times series, uh, where the author misses uh, in, his, in his assertion is uh, that, uh, that the world's largest data centers are also the largest contributors to waste and inefficiency. Uh, the truth is, uh, there's been real change in the way many of those uh, enormous data center operators think about energy consumption, and they've made significant strides towards becoming much more efficient. On the other hand, there's a much larger data center footprint that encompasses the rest of the world, the non-Googles, non-Facebooks, non-Apples, non-Microsofts. Uh, which has taken energy efficiency, uh, which has not taken energy, energy efficiency, excuse me, as much to heart uh, and are still wasting as much as half of their data center budgets because of that. Uh, in fact, it's safe to say that much of the headway that we've seen in data center efficiency has been a result of initiatives taken by the world's largest Internet companies. Uh, on the other hand, a large majority of the smaller data centers um, and especially enterprise data centers, have yet to embrace energy efficiency or green technologies. So while much has been started, there's an awful lot yet to be done, especially as Internet and cloud utilization continues to skyrocket. And if you take a, take a look at just the latest set of uh, laptop substitutes, uh, Google's Chromebooks, they are absolutely promoting only the cloud. And with the smartphone market also continuing to grow, there's no question uh, that lowering data center operational costs has got to climb on the list of priorities, even as rising costs of energy and growing demands will continue to force IT managers and facilities operators to better understand their current efficiency levels and to develop plans on how to improve them. So with that said, to discuss the growing importance of energy efficiency in data centers, we've got with us uh, two exciting speakers. We've got John Stanley, who is the Senior Analyst uh, of Data Center Technologies and Eco-Efficient IT at 451 Research. Uh, John's primary areas of focus are energy efficiency and sustainability in data centers and enterprise IT. Uh, with John, we'll also be joined by Andy Chalupka, who is the Solution Marketing Manager uh, of Global Data Center Solution Development at Panduit. Andy joined Panduit back in 2000 and currently serves, uh, as I said, as, as Solution Marketing Manager, uh, and his primary responsibilities include strategy for Panduit's Intelligent Data Center Solution. Uh, Andy is based in Panduit's world headquarters, and I just want to note that I had the opportunity to visit uh, that uh, world headquarters shortly after it was completed just a couple of years ago. And if nothing else, I can tell you that as part of this webinar, uh, Panduit's uh, uh, an ideal company to be talking about uh, energy efficiency as uh, it has taken that concept of energy efficiency to heart in its own uh, headquarters facility and as such can speak not only from a product standpoint and from a market research standpoint, but also as a real world lead gold certified facility. So before I hand the, uh, today's event over to John, just a couple of quick general notes. Uh, we have built in a Q&A session following today's event. You all have interfaces on your screens, and I encourage you to use those to send your questions to us at any time as they come up during today's event. And you'll also all be receiving follow-up emails that are going to include contact information if you want to follow up with additional questions or just need uh, some more detail. Uh, you'll also receive details on how you can access the archived version of today's webinar. I certainly encourage you to pass all that information along to your colleagues who might not have been able to join us for today's live event. Uh, so with that, I'm very happy to 
introduce John Stanley from 451 Research, who's going to get us started with a look at what's really going on in the data center market. John? Thank you, Eric. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, again, I'm John Stanley with uh, 451 uh, Senior Analyst focusing on uh, data center technologies and uh, eco-efficient IT. Uh, I'm going to be setting the context uh, by talking about uh, data center energy use uh, first up. And just in case some of you may not have heard of uh, 451 Research, we're an IT industry analyst company. Uh, our analysts cover a wide variety of topics, uh, technology and uh, market developments in enterprise IT. So we cover everything from servers and storage to virtualization, cloud computing, uh, digital security, uh, pretty much the whole gamut of topics. Uh, again, where I focus is on data centers, so I'm interested in power and cooling technologies in data centers, uh, software for managing data centers efficiently, and developments on the IT side that can help make uh, data centers more efficient, things like low power servers or server power management. Uh, as Eric mentioned uh, earlier, many of you have probably seen the uh, the New York Times series on uh, data center efficiency. I think uh, you know this this uh, goes to show that the general public is definitely paying attention to data center energy consumption. Uh, I think as are uh, policymakers. And uh, Eric, you know, hit the nail right on the head when uh, he pointed out that a lot of the the big data centers. Um, are actually very efficient uh, in terms of uh, the Googles and the Apples and the Microsofts of the world. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, there are lots of enterprise data centers out there and uh, smaller data centers that don't have as many resources to put into uh, being energy efficient. Uh, many of them uh, waste a lot of energy uh, just because they don't know any better or haven't had the opportunity to make improvements. And if you add up all of these smaller data centers, then it comes out to be uh, way more energy use than uh, some of the bigger uh, mammoth data centers that, that you read about in the news. And so it's very, very important to address uh, efficiency in all of these other data centers uh, that are out there. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, electricity costs are uh, a big piece of running a data center. If you only look at the data center's facility operating costs, so this is things like electricity, staffing for the facility, uh, property taxes, and things like that, it's not uncommon to see electricity be over 50% over of a data center's uh, facility operating cost. And even if you factor in, uh, if you look at the total cost of the facility in terms of both uh, the operating cost and the capital cost that it took to build that facility, uh, electricity still comes in uh, often at about 30% of the total cost uh, of having that facility under fairly uh, conventional assumptions. So that's electricity bills. Uh, the other way that energy costs come into a data center is that the data center capital cost itself is driven by the amount of uh, power that the data center it needs to deliver to IT. Uh, because for every kilowatt of IT that you need to support, you have to buy a kilowatt of generator capacity, a kilowatt of UPS capacity, a uh, sufficient number of batteries to connect to those UPSs. You have to buy all sorts of cooling systems to get that kilowatt of thermal heat uh, back out of the data center so that things uh, don't overheat. And so if you can be more efficient uh, in terms of, uh, of IT power and lower power use in general, uh, you may be able to save on facility capital costs. Um, and typical facility capital costs you know, come in somewhere at uh, 15 million a megawatt or uh, $15,000 per kilowatt of IT load that you're trying to support for, um, you know, kind of a typical quote unquote enterprise data center. So, uh, so these facilities can get fairly expensive, uh, and that expense, again, is driven by energy. Uh, and, and just to emphasize, a lot of the uh, focus and the dialogue around uh, efficiency in data centers has been around PUE or power usage effectiveness, which, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, is a measure of how efficient the data center facility is. But the, efficiency, uh, the uh, facility is only one piece of the efficiency puzzle. The other piece of the efficiency puzzle is what is the uh, efficiency of the IT that's uh, running within that facility. Uh, 
and some of the problems you run into, uh, which I'll get into more on the, uh, the next slide, uh, but, but a big problem uh, in the realm of IT efficiency is poor utilization of uh, servers. And so this chart that uh, comes from a report done by the Green Grid uh, shows some statistics on unused servers from a, uh, a data center survey that the Green Grid conducted. And what you can see uh, across the, uh, the, the horizontal axis of this chart are you know, different percentages of uh, unused servers that uh, users found in their data center. And then the vertical axis is you know, what fraction of users uh, found that many servers. So uh, as you can see, you know, many users are doing okay. 40% you know, of the people in the survey said, you know, we think that fewer than one in 20 of our servers are sitting around unused. But you can also see that a substantial fraction of data center users thought that, you know, 5% or 10% or 25% of their servers were, were in their data center uh, plugged in, turned on, consuming energy, and not really doing anything uh, that was adding business value. And, and a full 20% of uh, people in the survey didn't even know how many unused servers they had. So this is one example of... Um, you know, where IT efficiency can be uh, very important and where, you know, there's areas of waste that you can find in a data center and hopefully improve upon. Um, you know, if you look at the kind of laundry list of challenges related to energy use in the data center, uh, you know, I've talked about electricity bills, I've talked about capital costs. There are other challenges uh, on the facility side. Um, one big one is poor airflow management. And what can often happen in a data center is even if you have sufficient uh, cooling capacity, you know, on paper in terms of uh, the, the tons of your chiller and the amount of air handlers that you have, if you have poor airflow management and you can't get cold air to the right place within your data center, um, then you can run into problems with hotspots uh, that can threaten server reliability. It can uh, impede your ability to add more data centers, or sorry, to add more servers into your data center, uh, because if you already have a hotspot where things are overheating, you certainly can't put another heat generating server uh, in that area. And what happens uh, in, in some cases is that you end up with stranded capacity where you have, again, maybe plenty of capacity in terms of uh, your UPS or your cooling systems on paper, but you're not able to actually use it because hotspots and, and airflow problems make it impractical to, uh, to add more uh, IT equipment without things overheating. And you know, as we, I discussed earlier, uh, data center capacity, uh, that $15,000 a kilowatt is really expensive, and so you, know, you definitely don't want to waste it. There are also challenges on the IT side. Again, poor utilization. Uh, sometimes there are also uh, inefficient IT choices that get made in terms of maybe buying a server with a, a power supply that's not very efficient. And uh, choosing servers that uh, maybe don't do as much useful work per watt as, uh, as one might like. Another challenge on the IT side is even just quantifying what useful IT work per watt uh, actually means. And then there's another set of challenges around uh, changing conditions within the data center. This can be uh, changing conditions as normal assets turn over and uh, new servers are added and old servers are taken away. Um, data centers are also getting increasingly dynamic, and so you can even have changes from hour to hour as uh, servers are ramping up virtual machines and working harder versus uh, ramping down and doing less. There can be changes in uh, how available uh, free outside air cooling is uh, at any given point in the day, and so data centers uh, need to be able to respond to changing energy use profiles. Just, uh, just as a, an example of this kind of dynamism, and how the dynamic nature of a data center is uh, increasing over time. This chart is uh, data taken from SPEC. So these is, this is SPEC power benchmarking data from uh, a few different server models over time. The horizontal axis on this graph is uh, the performance of a server in terms of uh, operations per second, so basically how, how fast it's doing work, and the vertical axis is how much power the server uses. And the, the thing that I want to draw your attention to is if you look at this middle line, that green line, a few years ago, uh, you know, this was a server model that would draw 
250 watts when it was working as hard as it could, uh, but it was still drawing about 175 when it was idling and uh, twiddling its thumbs. And what that means is that regardless of how much work the server is doing, the power use of the server doesn't change that much. Um, However, if you look at more recent server models, uh, like at the red line on the bottom, you see that this server actually uses uh, significantly less energy when it is idle. And what that means is that compared to older models of servers, the newer models of servers are going to swing more uh, in terms of their energy use going up and down uh, depending on how heavily they're being used. And so that's an example of a trend that is making energy use in a data center uh, more dynamic and increasingly uh, requiring data center operators to think about that dynamism and uh, be able to, to use tools uh, and data center designs to address it. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, hand things over to Andy. Thank you, John. <clears throat> this is Andy Chalupka from the Pandua Corporation. And before I get started with my presentation, I'd like to just introduce Pandua to those in the audience who may not be familiar with with the company. Uh, Panduit is a, a world-class developer and provider of leading-edge infrastructure solutions to help customers optimize their uh, uh, communications across their entire enterprise. Founded in 1955, it's grown to 4,000 employees that operate in 112 countries, and we offer a range of products, services, and software that we take to the market with a solution approach to um, address problems in the data center, in connected buildings, and industrial automation. So as John was talking about the high cost of energy, um, we, it, it's, it's bringing a new reality to data center managers. The, the, the statistic that 50% of the overall data expenditure is related to power is forcing them to better understand how they're using the available power and focus on management practices and physical infrastructure solutions that will help them optimize their energy efficiency, maximize the uh, space utilization and capacity utilization in their data center, and also uh, reduce operational costs. In this presentation, I want to explore a, uh, an approach to optimizing energy efficiency in the data center, and it keys in on three, three basic elements. The measurement of the current state to understand what your efficiency is and then, and then benchmark it for comparison against uh, further improvements. Um, outline some improvements to the physical infrastructure that can optimize energy efficiency and then talk about how you continue to maintain this efficiency after you've invested in these improvements and uh, help, help manage it over time as the data center, as the data center evolves. So I try, to, I try to put this in context by looking at how fast data processing is growing. Uh, this is an interesting proof point regarding this, and it also illustrates what data center managers are faced with. Cisco has cited that IP traffic or global IP traffic is expected to reach 767 exabytes per year or 64 exabytes per month. It, uh, it's a result or results in a combined annual processing growth rate of, of 30, 36%. Now, I, I personally don't know what an exabyte looks like, but to get my head around it, I found another stat that uh, 64 exabytes is roughly the equivalent of 32 million people streaming Avatar 3D continuously for an entire month. So as John indicated, a, a result of this explosive data processing growth is that data centers are often over-provisioned with power and cooling capacity in order to maintain service levels regardless of the actual IT equipment utilization. This approach has proven to be expensive and inefficient and it results in low server utilization, low server utilization rates 
and wasted energy. As energy and data center construction costs rise, data center managers are being challenged to improve overall energy efficiency and optimize utilization in order to, to sustain a low TCO over the life of the data center. And improving energy efficiency isn't the only part of the challenge. As data center energy consumption grows, it is drawing the attention of CFOs and corporate responsibility managers, and as the New York Times article indicated, uh, writers who are concerned with the impact of data center energy utilization on the environment. Uh, the result, data center managers are looking for a metric that they can track and use to communicate to shareholders, the local communities, or even government or environmental agencies on how efficient they are and what kind of progress they may be making on improving their efficiency. So as I mentioned before, uh, over-provisioning is is wasteful and, and costing data centers more money than they need to outlay. This graphic illustrates how energy is consumed in an average data center and points out that uh, uh, energy costs related to cooling accounts for approximately 40% of the total power outlay. It's actually the next largest component, next a cost component next to powering the IT equipment itself. So the path to improvement begins with an understanding of where you are and a good starting point in your effort to improve your efficiency is to know what your data center's PUE is. PUE is an acronym for Power Usage Effectiveness and while there are other methods of uh, determining efficiency a PUE seems to be the most widely accepted industry metric in use today. The green grid defines PUE simply as the total facility energy consumption divided by the IT equipment energy consumption. And according to the green grid, a PUE of 1.0 is the optimal rating and would mean that 100% of the energy delivered to the data center goes to the IT equipment. This isn't the case in reality. Um, the EPA has the current average PUE for data centers at 1.92. And most experts and pundits uh, cite a PUE of 1.2 as a good target PUE to attain. So once a, a metric has been decided upon, uh, you need to develop a method to, to, to benchmark where you are. And one of the best ways to do this if you don't have an in-house staff to, to conduct an analysis or an assessment is to hire an advisory service to assess where your energy is being used and how much is being used and be able to collect this data in a reliable and consistent manner. There are many approaches to capturing this data. However, it's important to establish consistency when collecting data at the point of entry or uh, collecting data about uh, what individual servers draw or how many kilowatt hours are being consumed, volts and amps at the cabinet level, power factors of distribution equipment, and then just the raw energy costs coming into the site. Panduit Advisory Services focuses on collecting information from six zones in the data center. And I have those illustrated on the screen now. Zone one is the point at which the power enters the building or, or point of entry. This is effectively the electric meter for the data center. Zone two collects information or, or we collect information at the switchgear distribution room to understand total energy consumption of supporting facility services, including UPSs, cracks, air handling units, chillers, and lighting. Zone three gets a little more granular and uh, focuses on collecting uh, energy information at the data center mechanical equipment 
and supporting facility services level. Zone 4 collects information at data center power distribution units to capture PDU branch circuit power consumption. Zone 5 captures uh, power consumption at data centers and standalone equipment at the room or rack level. And finally, Zone 6 collects power consumption data at the individual device level to understand exactly what the IT devices are consuming. This, this level allows Panduit Advisory Services to get a very good view of how power is being consumed within the data center. So once collected, this data is used to calculate a benchmark PUE and also help identify and isolate particular problem areas. But the raw data doesn't tell the whole story regarding challenges to your energy efficiency. At this point, it might also be prudent to uh, conduct a more in-depth assessment and, and CFD analysis to help understand some of the problem areas that you may be experiencing and that may be negatively impacting your overall data energy efficiency. So a CFD analysis and detailed assessment can give you a view of what's happening with your airflow. Are there hot air, cold air recirculation problems? Do you have significant leakage or bypass air either coming out from underneath an access floor or are a series of cabinets particularly leaking. It can also help you map out under, underutilized space and identify where stranded power or stranded capacity is. So once the assessment's been completed and once you have an idea of what your PUE is, You'll probably have many, many areas within the data center in which to look for energy efficiency improvements. Given the share of data center energy consumption that power and cooling command, that's probably a good area to start looking for some uh, ways that will help you realize short-term savings and directly impact PUE. ASHRAE, Intel, and Panduit Labs have all confirmed that raising the supplier temperature in the data center is one of the most effective means of improving energy efficiency. ASHRAE has determined that for every one degree centigrade rise in chiller water temperature, a three to four percent cooling system energy savings can be realized. The savings derive from being able to deliver a higher temperature to the uh, cooling units, in essence creating a, a smaller temperature differential for the chiller units to, to cool, allowing them to work less, saving more, more power. Space utilization is another area that can impact efficiency. While the average per cabinet heat load is four kilowatts per cabinet, Gartner reports that 50% of data centers have multiple cabinets with heat loads in excess of 10 kilowatts. This often results in high heat load devices being spread around the data center in underutilized cabinets to avoid creating hot spots and minimize the impact on existing cooling capacity. Consolidation of high heat load devices and cabinets can not only help reclaim floor space, but also give you an opportunity to optimize existing cooling capacity to meet these, these increased loads. So how do you, how do you translate the savings of, uh, of a rise in the chiller water temperature to, to your data center? The, the primary way that this can be accomplished is by to completely separate the hot air from the cold air within the data center. This can be done at a variety of levels, including the cabinet level. A great place to start is to ensure that every, every gap is sealed to uh, provide, uh, prevent hot air from being recirculated within the cabinet. Uh, hot air recirculating within the cabinet can cause higher inlet temperatures, 
uh, at, at certain devices, not at all the devices necessarily in a cabinet. Well, when that occurs, the tendency is to turn down the temperature of the data center to, to correct that problem. So you may correct the problem for one or two servers that may be influenced by hot air recirculation, but in the process of doing that, you're overcooling the majority of the data center. Another method is to direct the cold air to where it, to where it needs to go. There's a lot of devices out there that don't have traditional front-to-back uh, cooling airflow, um, side to, uh, switches that breathe from side to side are at risk of um, not only throwing hot air off into uh, the next rack or cabinet and then overheating uh, devices next to it, but also intaking elevated air temperature. So in-cabinet ducting helps direct cooling air directly into the device inlet and then exhaust it directly into the hot aisle to help maintain hot aisle cold aisle cooling strategies. Uh, inlet ducting has been shown to uh, reduce inlet temperatures by as much as 14 degrees centigrade by, by maintaining this level of separation. So the story for maintaining cold air and hot air separation is also applied at a higher level so that you can affect the separation within the data center itself. And the most common method of doing this is to employ containment. So illustrated, we're showing a, uh, a set of our net access cabinets with our net contain vertical exhaust ducts that, as you can see from the CFD graphic to the right, <clears throat> are effectively uh, ensuring that the hot exhaust air is being vented directly up into the plenum, which does two things. One, it ensures that this hot air doesn't get a chance to cool off before it's returned to the cooling system. So this is this concept of returning uh, warmer air to the cooling system so it doesn't have to work as hard. And then two, it's keeping the hot air or it's preventing the hot air from mixing with the cooler air in the data center so you have better better separation and a more predictable and consistent cooling air delivery to the fronts of the cabinets. And then finally, uh, we can look at creating high density zones. Uh, earlier I mentioned the fact that while data centers typically have a four to five kilowatt average rating, there's always cabinets that have significantly higher heat loads in them. Um, we're seeing more interest in creating high density zones or pods, which allows data center managers to consolidate the high heat load cabinets into one area of the data center. And typically this is done with containment. In this case, we're looking at a cold aisle containment system that's encasing a, a group of high density cabinets. And what this allows you to do is uh, uh, concentrate the amount of cooling that can be delivered to those cabinets. So that in turn allows increased densities in a, in a smaller amount of space. It helps consolidate the high heat loads, meaning it takes them out of the general area of the data center and, and eliminates hot spots. And then as you, as you uh, grow your data center or add capacity, or compute capacity rather, uh, you, can, you can make incremental improvements in terms of adding a pod or two pods that have a predictable uh, cooling and power capacity. So that, that'll ease the, the planning and the, and the implementation of additional compute power. So there's, there's one other consideration, and that's to look before you leap. Implementation of containment systems, in-cabinet ducting, and sealing, or the, or the creation of high-density zone architectures, or, or some of the other changes you might be considering, uh, can challenge existing data center design assumptions and potentially introduce greater risk to the network and its operation. A well, question you might, you might have before you make some change to your physical infrastructure is 
how can you be sure that the proposed improvements will A, perform as specified, B, provide the required ROI, and then C, be able to adapt to your changing needs before you make the investment? One way is to model the real-life configurations and conditions and to give you a chance to validate their performance. This is accomplished by investing in services that can uh, help you design your data center and then, uh, similar to the assessment, uh, model it and model it across uh, a variety of conditions and, and configurations. Investing in this type of service can help you evaluate alternative solutions, again, ahead of the implementation, uh, help you calculate potential savings from the proposed improvements, and also help you identify issues before they occur. So again, data centers are a highly dynamic environment Power consumption, environmental, and environmental variables are constantly changing. Now, once you, uh, you've, you've benchmarked your PUE and you've, and you've implemented your efficiency improvements, the next challenge is to maintain these gains over the life cycle of the data center. And one of the challenges is without being able to see what's going on on a, on a regular basis, your, your operational increases or I'm sorry, your operational expenses have a tendency to creep up as changes are made and not accounted for or not accommodated by, by adjusting other parts of your infrastructure. You can find that over time, uh, you'll be right back at the situation that you found yourself in the first place of not understanding what your PUE is, uh, costs going up, and no real plan on how to accommodate that. Hey, Andy. Yep. May, may I, this is Eric. May I jump in for one second? We got a question here um, re referring to um, uh, a slide that you just went through. I just wanted to get to this question uh, while it was still fresh in, in your mind and uh, our audience's mind. There's a, a specific question regarding um, uh, a one degree Celsius rise in water temperature translating into three to four percent cooling system energy savings. Yes. Um, does, does the question is, does that mean if, that, if we don't have to cool the chiller water for one degree, uh, will, will we save energy in that respect? Um, I, I, it, it really relates to the cooling, cooling system having to work less. But the, as the return temperature goes up, the, the differential that the cooling system has to make up goes down. So the impact is on the chiller unit and the, the craw fans delivering that energy to the, to the chilling system. Got it. Thanks, Andy. I, I hope that, uh, that answers the question. Thank you. Okay. So one, one way to uh, help control and maintain your efficiency gains is to monitor your environmental conditions and your power consumption on a real-time basis. This is a growing trend and uh, data center dynamics has put out some charts that I have up on the screen that indicate who's monitoring and, and what they're monitoring and, and why. So generally, the more power you're consuming, the more, the more the power is being monitored so that people can have an understanding of, of how to manage that cost. And it's interesting to know what they're monitoring. Temperature is, is by far the, the the characteristic that's being monitored the most as is humidity. And as we know, as, as equipment uh, operations change, that's one of the variables that can change quite, quite quickly. 
So how can power, temperature, humidity, and other key variables be monitored? There's a, a growing use of DSIM software platforms integrated with intelligent hardware devices that capture environmental power and consumption data uh, being deployed to report on a continuous basis. These devices are typically, or Panduit would typically integrate these devices across six zones so that information in real time can be aggregated into a software platform. And I won't go through the zones again, but they're, they're the same six zones that I described earlier. So an example of, of how this data can be used and how it can be aggregated is through uh, Unite by Panduit's six zone software platform and, and uh, hardware platform that collects, aggregates, and produces management information reports that enable data center managers to perform real-time monitoring of power and environmental conditions, uh, enhancing their ability to manage the data center and, the, and their power capacity. So before I turn it over to John, to talk a little bit more about DSIM, just want to uh, hit on three key points. That of measuring the current state to establish a benchmark that you can make improvements from, uh, identify and implement uh, improvements, and then develop a, a, a plan or a method to maintain these energy efficiency gains and PUE ratings by uh, constant monitoring within the data center. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Andy. So, uh, DSIM is definitely a, uh, a major research area here at uh, 451, and that's one of the areas that uh, I focus on uh, very heavily. So, I'd like to just zoom out a little bit uh, and talk about the broader context of uh, the DSIM market. So. Uh, DSIM, you know, obviously means uh, many things to uh, to many people. Uh, DSIM, you know, part of it is about energy. Uh, as uh, Andy mentioned, uh, there's a monitoring component of DSIM. Uh, other people, when they think about DSIM, they think of uh, IT asset management. So uh, th there's varying interpretations of the term. Uh, at 451, we have a, a fairly broad definition of DSIM. Uh, we think of DSIM as software for helping uh, data center operators uh, collect and manage information about a data center's assets, its operational status, uh, and its resource use in terms of uh, space power and cooling. And really the goal of DSIM is to bring together this information and help data center operators make uh, better decisions about how to run their data centers uh, optimally. There are several different uh, functional components to DSIM. Uh, at 451, when we think of the, the, the kind of the core of DSIM, uh, one piece of, of that is uh, obviously uh, monitoring. And this can be power and environmental monitoring. Uh, it can be basic alarming uh, around, you know, is a, are pieces of equipment uh, in a fault stat or not. Uh, it can be tracking server power use or, uh, or even the utilization levels of, uh, of servers. So those are uh, many of the things that go into the monitoring bucket. The other piece of the core DSIM platform is uh, asset change and configuration management and uh, you know, tactical capacity planning uh, features. And there are a lot of DSIM systems uh, out there that are focused on that. And both uh, monitoring and asset management uh, focused DSIM systems uh, will generally also have a uh, dashboarding and reporting capability to bring all this information uh, up to a data center operator's fingertips and, and make it maximally useful. Um, in addition to these things, um, within the realm of DSIM, uh, you also find things like dynamic cooling optimization, so uh, adjusting cooling systems in real time in response to uh, changing environmental conditions uh, within a data center. Also within DSIM, uh, you find things 
uh, like IT power management. This can be putting servers to sleep when they're not needed or throttling back uh, a server processor if, to save some energy if its uh, full performance isn't needed uh, at a given moment. And, and then the last piece uh, within the sphere of DSIM components is uh, a set of functions we like to, to refer to as data center business planning. And this is the uh, more long-term or strategic uh, modeling or forecasting of a data center's uh, performance or, or costs uh, over time. So you can think of, uh, you know, asset change and configuration type uh, capacity planning as being uh, short-term and tactical, and then there's another set of functionality that looks uh, more long-term and strategic and uh, predictive about uh, how a data center is going to perform. If you take this, um, this feature landscape and uh, overlay uh, some of the suppliers in the DSIM market over it, uh, suppliers fall into uh, several interesting buckets. Um, there are a lot of suppliers on this graph. This is by no means uh, all of the suppliers. There are uh, very many competitors in the DSIM market. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, even though I've, I've tried to put these suppliers in um, kind of buckets that broadly characterize where they focus, um, obviously many DSIM systems do many different things, so these may not, this may not be representative of the only features that uh, any particular DSIM vendor has, uh, but I, I think it's a good snapshot of where the main focus areas are. So, uh, so just to clarify that. If you ask data center operators why they're interested in DSIM, uh, there are several reasons. So uh, what I've got up on screen now is data from uh, an Uptime Institute survey of uh, data center operators. Uh, when asked, you know, what are the main reasons that you invest in DSIM, uh, the most popular reason is uh, better management of data center capacity. So again, uh, power cooling space. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, data center capacity is, uh, is very expensive. Uh, the last thing you want to happen as a data center operator is to, uh, to run out of capacity and uh, have to build an expansion to your data center or go build a new data center uh, since these things are, are so capital intensive. So one of the best uses of DSEM that, that people are most interested in is really uh, using the tool to get the most out of their uh, existing capacity before they have to, uh, to do a new build or an expansion. Uh, people also use DSIM to um, get v better visibility into uh, inventories of IT assets uh, and identify problems that could threaten availability. Uh, energy use came out to be uh, number four in the survey, so also a high priority for data center operators. And uh, then there are uh, lots of other reasons uh, for investing in DSIM as well. Uh, on the flip side, if you look at the barriers to DSIM adoption, uh, again, this is data from the same survey, uh, you know, the, the number one with the bullet is that uh, many, many data center operators, uh, you know, think that DSIM, says, say that uh, DSIM costs more than they would like. Uh, you know, at, uh, we think at 451 that, you know, there's a lot of value in DSIM systems, uh, obviously, but cost is often a, a big barrier to, uh, to implementation. There are also challenges around integrating DSIM systems with, um, with existing equipment and software that uh, a data center may have. Uh, it, it can be challenging to initially populate uh, IT asset management databases within a DSIM system and make sure that uh, all the physical servers that you have in your data center are accurately logged and uh, recorded in the database. And also, a lot, of, um, a lot of data center managers, they say, yeah, you know, we recognize the value of DSIM, um, but, you know, we think that our existing tools, uh, you know, homegrown systems or the, uh, the, the uh, kludge of spreadsheets that we use are, you know, we're getting by with that and, you know, we, we don't yet see the need to, uh, to advance in more specialized software, even if they recognize that, uh, you know, they may be looking for such software in a few years. So these are some of the, the barriers to DSIM adoption uh, that we've seen when we talk to end users at 451. Um, you know, on net, we definitely think that the, the drivers for adoption are going to outweigh the, uh, the barriers. And so we do uh, predict that the DSIM market is going to grow significantly uh, over the next few years. This is data from a uh, market sizing report on the DSIM market 
that uh, we released last year, we think that the DSM market was about $245 million in uh, 2010, and we're predicting that it's going to grow to around $1.3 billion by uh, 2015. So that's a, uh, a significant growth rate. We're also in the process of uh, updating these numbers as we do a new edition of the market sizing, and so um, we expect to have updated numbers out on this soon. Uh, so hopefully that provides some context for uh, the, the broader DSM market in general. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Andy. Thanks again, John. Um, we're just uh, going to conclude here. Um, I think I already went over this slide, so or the contents of this slide, rather. So I'll just skip to the next one and say thanks to our, our audience for participating today and the questions that we're going to get. And do I turn it over to Eric at this point? Andy, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, both Andy and John for a fantastic presentation. Um, and as promised, uh, we're going to get uh, right into a Q&A. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, and any other questions that we don't have time to get to during the live event uh, will have been archived. And I know the folks over at uh, Panduit will be more than happy to answer those offline following uh, today's event. Um, one question that uh, that I think needs to be asked is, so, so we talk about PUE, PUE measurements. Uh, how often should you measure PUE, PUE? Well, we're we're suggesting that if you implement the DSIM software that you can do this on, a, on an almost real-time basis. So it can, be done, it can be done almost minute, minute by minute. Now, what what is the advantage of measuring it in in near real time as opposed to uh, at at uh, some sort of regular longer intervals? You can uh, track how it's fluctuated and look for trends or patterns that could suggest the problem. Um, you can a a attain it at any moment if if there's a, an inquiry by management or by an environmental or governmental agency. I also think it can be it can be helpful to, you know, think of PUE uh, in, instead of or maybe in addition to taking snapshots of PUE over time. Um, you know, I think, and, uh, and the Green Grid recommends that it's also very helpful to track um, you know, what is your average PUE over time, right? So if you look at what's the, what's the total amount of energy that a data center has used over a course of the year um, divided by the, uh, the total amount of energy that the IT has used over the course of the year, um, that can give you a PUE number that's, uh, you know, an average and, and not, um, not swayed by uh, any unusual conditions that may happen to, uh, to arise when you're measuring it. You know, so for instance, if you took your PUE snapshot uh, in the middle of the night when it was very cold outside, it would look much better than if you took your PUE snapshot uh, at a time when it was really hot and your data center uh, cooling system was, uh, was running full out. So uh, w one way to correct that is, um, again, to look at this average over you know, months or, uh, or a year. And uh, another way to look at it is, uh, as Andy said, uh, to take you know lots and lots of samples over time, and then see about where the average is. Thanks, guys. Um, so when when you talk about uh, you know, and we we all started talking about trying to figure you, one of the first things you have to do is understand where you are today before you can figure out where where you can go or where you should get to, um, and, and in terms of um, having those assessments, making those assessments. Um, Andy. Ooh, what type, who can provide those kinds of assessments and assessment services, and uh, what, are those, uh, what do those services typically entail? Well, there, there's a lot of people that can do it, and Panduit's included. Uh, Panduit has a, a group called Panduit Advisory Services, and they have practices that focus specifically on uh, energy assessments, data center assessments, data center design services, um, and also uh, services to help you implement a DSIM and, and instrumentation program. Andy, thank you. Um, 
uh, and I guess I'll, I'll wrap up with John. John, do, do you find that um, uh, enterprises typically start with an assessment process, or, or do they typically think they know what's going on in their data centers? I think it it, var it varies widely by um, by enterprise. I think uh, you know some data centers have a good idea of what they're doing, and they just need uh, uh, software and other tools to help them collect with the da uh, the data, which they can then uh, analyze themselves. Uh, I've also heard of uh, the opposite model where uh, data center operators find it really beneficial to have someone uh, come in and uh, not only put in the DSIM system, but also help them uh, figure out where they are in terms of energy efficiency and make improvements, and then they will uh, continue on using the DSIM system to, to maintain that efficiency uh, over time. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, that, that does take us to the end of the uh, short Q&A. As I mentioned to everybody in our audience, uh, all the questions uh, have been archived, and uh, our, the folks over at Panduit will be more than happy to get back to you on those following today's event. Uh, also, be on the lookout for a follow-up email with contact information if you should have additional questions uh, for either the 451 group or Panduit. And, and again, you'll get information on how to access the archived version of today's fantastic event. Uh, again, thank you you to both uh, John and Andy, uh, and thank you, a warm thank you to all of uh, our folks in the audience who were able to join us today. Thanks again, and have a wonderful afternoon.